typography has been the, the passion for uh, my 20 years since I started studying at Parsons. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, with Charlie's teaching. I, everything I learned about typography, I learned uh, because of Charlie, and I thank you for that. Uh, I would like to give you a, a quick introduction about where I come from. Um, that's me. I was born in Korea, in Seoul, uh, in 1971. And at the time, and these are my grandparents. At the time, Korea was a very poor country, uh, recovering from Korean War. And uh, lots of people um, really were having a hard time uh, in Korea and wanted to immigrate to the United States. And, and a lot of people did. And uh, for those who couldn't immigrate to the United States, uh, they ended up going uh, for a second option and Brazil was one of those countries because immigration was uh, easier. So I grew up in Korea until I was, when I was about 10 years old. And I, until then, I'd never seen a Western person in my life. I had never uh, tasted Western foods. I never read anything Western. My only contact with Western world was watching TV in black and white. And a lot of it was Japanese cartoons, so we had some like GI influence, you know, like we ate m and and Spam was really like the highlight of like the Western food experience. So I jumped from this sort of, you know, a cocoon of Korean culture to a, a crazy world of Brazil. And uh, it really happened from just one day to another. I just took an airplane, which I never had taken before. and. I landed in this crazy place of soccer and samba. Everything was different, people and language, food, climate. So it really was like going to a different planet for me. And uh, I, you know, it really opened a lot of my mind. And when I arrived there, I was about 10 years old. And um, you know, after about three, three months, I went to uh, the school without really speaking any words in Portuguese. So I remember my uncle, uh, who was living there for a couple of years before us, he took me to the school and he drove me to school and said, you have to learn one thing uh, uh, to say in Portuguese, which is raise your hand and to ask the teacher if I can go to the bathroom. So that was the only thing I could speak in Portuguese, may I go to the bathroom? And he was very smart to point that to me. And so, so everything was improvisation, uh, being in Brazil, having to you know, communicate with Brazilians and, and, and how to speak Portuguese and so on. Uh, so I went to high school there and I finally learned how to speak in Portuguese. And then when I finished high school, I really wanted to, school, uh, to, to study art and my parents were supportive of that idea and uh, then I jump from this one crazy world to another crazy world, which is New York City. And it was another a cultural shock for me, because um, I had never been to New York before that. And I came to study um, at Parsons. And when I first came to Parsons, my, my dream was to become an artist, because growing up, you know, I was a fan of uh, you know, Van Gogh's and Picasso's, and I wanted to study fine art and become uh, a famous painter or sculptor. And I studied one year of fine arts when I was in Parsons, and I quickly realized that looking at the seniors who were graduating from fine arts program, that there was absolutely uh, no hope of making a living out of uh, fine arts. And you know, they were waiting tables or became like, you know, doing construction work. And my parents were investing a lot of money in me, and I wanted to at least make my and earn my living after I graduate. So I started to look in other programs at Parsons and thinking, well, maybe I can study environmental design. But then I saw the work that uh, graphic design students were doing, and I really liked it because it was uh, both conceptual and also highly artistic. So I, I said, well, I think I could study graphic design. And I went to the graphic design program, and that's uh, when I really fell in love with graphic design because I thought, yes, I can really uh, 
learn a skill that I can make a living out of, and also I can really be experimental and artistic the way I wanted to do with fine art. And uh, my first uh, typography teacher was, was Charles Nix, and uh, one of the first assignments that uh, Charlie gave to the class was uh, a project called Walter's Image, which is a classic, I believe, Cooper Union sort of school of thinking of Herb Lubellin, who did wonderful Walter's Image, you know, mother and child and family, you know, you may know. Uh, and it was also an interesting time uh, when I was studying graphic design at the time because it was a transition between the mechanical design to digital design. Those were the years that uh, the first computer lab was created, so you could learn Quark Express and all these things that uh, previous years didn't have the opportunity. So I took the last class of mechanical design of actually taking the ruby lead and laying out and you know with, with your hand having to do the tracking and letting and so on, So which was really uh, helpful to me. But uh, the World Jazz Image was one of those projects that uh, I really enjoyed doing. It was very challenging. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you have to take a word and you have to illustrate the meaning behind that word only using the letters contained in that word. So you cannot add any external element behind it. So as an example, and this became like my insomnia project. Whenever I have a insomnia, I, I think about it. And I, I still keep doing this project after... I don't know, 18 years. So as an example, here is one of the orders image. So you just, I just flip the, the eye into, and make it into exclamation point. Another one is a elevator. DNA uh, becomes up and down. Diet. Election. Mm. Gravity, horizon. So it's really, it's like almost like uh, there are mysteries behind these words and they're just waiting to be unlocked. And you know, when you crack that mystery, there's a sense of accomplishment, like, okay, this, this is working and it's, it's, uh, I feel like I cracked the mystery behind that word. Comedy and drama. Tsunami. Ill. Clock. <laughs> and, and type is so, they're so wonderful in that sense that you can really be playful. They're like, they have personalities and they have Characters. Django. <laughs> and memory. So I think uh, Charles told us to come up with, I don't know, maybe six of these. And all of us did. And uh, uh, I, I enjoyed the process so much that uh, I kept doing this over the last 18 years. And I have about 100 of these now. And uh, I thought, well, this could turn into a book. And I uh, contacted uh, a few publishers. And uh, Penguin actually recently uh, 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 agreed to publish this as a book, which is a great, uh, exciting news for me. So it will come out next year in the fall. So uh, it has become like a lifelong project for me. Next project is called Universe Revolved, a 3D alphabet. This is, an, again, another uh, school project that I started when I was in Parsons. And it was uh, at, uh, during my junior year. And uh, they were introducing, uh, for the first time, the 3D programs. And the one program that we learned there was uh, this program called Adobe Dimension, which is a very rudimentary 3D program, which I believe doesn't exist anymore. But um, you know, it was, uh, this project started really as an experiment and then I ended up doing a lot of research uh, after that when I first came up with this uh, alphabet. And I ended up learning a lot about this project after I started. 
So here are the, uh, the 26 letters of the alphabet, A through Z. And for a lot of uh, years, I took these letters as granted. You know, you just read this in newspaper or in, in, in ads or in, in billboards. But you really don't really think about what's the origin of the alphabet or where they come from or what is the impact of alphabet in our everyday life. And as I did more and more research about it, I found out the amazing uh, and, and, and revolutionary aspect of these letters in the, from their very inception to, to today's. So I believe alphabet, the invention of the alphabet is as great as the invention of a fire or a wheel. And it all has to do with the fact that uh, uh, this alphabet is uh, phonetic. And uh, there are two types of uh, uh, written language. One is called phonetic, and another one is called ideogram. And all this I learned through doing research after I started the Universe Revolve project. So ideograms are uh, things like uh, um, the language from the Egyptian um, hieroglyphs. So each thing, each character has uh, his own meaning. Uh, it's based on ideas and images. So in, in hieroglyph, for instance, there are thousands and thousands of you know, these icons that you have to understand in order to make a sense about you know, the, the sentence or the, the scriptures. So that's why it's so hard to decipher uh, uh, hieroglyphs, and there's still people studying hieroglyphs and trying to decipher them. Another example is a Chinese character, and there are, again, thousands of characters that takes someone years to learn and memorize these characters. The difference, and the, what's so amazing about the invention of the alphabet, which, was, which happened about 1400 BC, uh, it was invented by Phoenicians, that these are not based on images, but they're based on sound. So each character has a sound attached to it, and when you combine the, the two characters, it forms a sound. So there are vowels and there are consonants. If you combine them, it produces a sound, which means you don't have to uh, memorize thousands of characters. All you have to memorize are a few characters, and you have to combine it, and it produces a sound. So the revolution, revolutionary aspect of it is that Anybody can learn how to read a text in a matter of uh, a day or even hours. And uh, the, the Greek uh, culture and the richness of Greek uh, um, you know, art and philosophy could really flourish because of, partially because of the, the alphabet, because they ended up adopting Phoenician alphabet. And, uh, so, and then and the, when the Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet, and that was about 750 BC, there were lots of experimentation going on. They added more characters, and they were experimenting with uh, reading and in directions. Like for instance, at the time, they were uh, they had this system called Bostrophedon, which literally means cow plowing the earth. So when you look at the cow plowing the earth to work work on the field. They go from the right, and then they turn, and they go back, and go back and forth again and again, and which is a, a more economical way of uh, reading a, a text because you don't have to jump. The way we read, you go from left to right, and you have to jump all the way to the beginning and then start all over, all over again. But they did. They, they flip the letter. You can see the now the letter appear flipped, like the P appear flipped again. So they would read it this way. Um, Eventually, the Romans uh, changed that system, and they also added a few characters. And uh, so the alphabet in the early days were going through lots of experiments, uh, which doesn't happen nowadays. So I thought um, those were really fascinating things that uh, you know that I would learn from alphabet, and why I was questioning why today alphabet doesn't evolve anymore, and. Um, and there are studies, for instance, that uh, you know, Western minds tend to process information from left to right. When we go to museum, we, we tend to study the painting from left to right because our mind is conditioned to process information from left to right because we're, we're so used to reading the text in that way. So 
uh, Universe Revolved is, a, is, a, is an attempt to uh, challenge the status quo of the alphabet and is an attempt to expand the experimentation of the alphabet from linear to spatial. So the way it works is at the, uh, the most left point of each ca capital letter of the alphabet, there is a, a, a vertical axis that's drawn. And then from the vertical axis, you can rotate the letters until the full 3D letters are formed. And here is a full set of uh, universe revolved from A, B, C to Z and their punctuations. There's a comma, exclamation point. The question mark is interesting because it looks like a, a light bulb to me. Uh, and then M dash and uh, asterisk and uh, parenthesis. The, the really the fascinating thing about this uh, font when I first created using Adobe Dimension was I had no idea how this each letter would be shaped because all I did was I took the letter and I just clicked the command revolve. So when I first did that with letter A, I thought, wow, that's really really fun shape, like. You know, like that looks like a pyramid, like a circular pyramid or something. And then I did B, and it looked totally different from A. And it was really like a fun experience to see how each letter was forming. And I think when I got to about letter F, I thought, okay, now I can really develop a font. The only thing that I was nervous was that, okay, if there's any two letters that are identical, then this, doesn't, this system doesn't work. And the system doesn't work for, uh, for numerals, for instance, because 0 and 9 would look exactly the same, therefore would not work. But fortunately, all the 26 letters look different. M and N were, are similar, but you can see there's still a difference in the width and then the, also the thickness of the, the top part. Uh, so now that uh, the, the 26 letters are formed, you know, because they're three-dimensional, uh, shapes that can be rotated, they can be stacked, they can be set in motion. So whole world of experimentations uh, were possible. And these are the letters uh, seen from the side. So once I had the, the, the font ready, I could form sentences such as this. Uh, so Somebody wants to try to read this? Reading? Reading is fun, yes. Um, so, and the funny thing is, um, I show this to children who are like 12, 13, who know how to read. They're usually a lot faster than adults, which I think reveals that their mind is still open and fresh for new things. Here is uh, the famous nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty set on a wall. So you see the W, and then Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. <laughs> all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So here I'm you know, experimenting with the stacking the letters, which Usually it looks horrible when we stack the letters with uh, you know, our regular alphabet. But here, because of the shape and because of three-dimensionality, they become interesting objects. Also, um, I was experimenting with the, uh, the reading directions. Uh, when, you, when we look at our regular uh, flat alphabet, um, you know, when you have like the, the ambulance, they, this, they flip the ambulance sign because when you are driving and you look at the mirror, the ambulance reads correctly because they're flipped. Some letters, because they're asymmetrical, you know, looped, has inconsistency, like letter B or letter C, when they're flipped uh, sideways, they look different. But because uh, Universe Revolve have, they're all symmetrical, now you can read in both directions and they're consistent. So I was experimenting the, uh, with the, uh, the the bi-dimensionality of reading. So, um, who wants to try to read this one? Sorry. 
It's almost there. It's a palindrome. You know what the palindromes are? Palindromes are words or sentences you can read in both directions, like mom or dad. So here is a, I saw, I was, I. And you can read it in both directions as well. There's a more uh, visual word, wake up. Uh, famous phrase by Pablo Picasso, everything you can imagine is real. And then I started to experiment with, you know, making objects with these letters, and they actually spell what the object is. So there's S H I P, and then I repeated some words, some letters. So it's a ship, and here's a P O L I C E, police, and then rocket, R O C. AET, and these are like laser and antennas on top. There are more objects. Um, and then I started really, get, like, I love creating these objects because they're like toys, and um, I had lots of fun doing that. And I start, started to study, like, the motion of how some of this thing would work. So, like, the, here's a taxi, T A X I, would fly and then you can land and become like terrain a vehicle. Same thing with the bike. You could also fly and, and ride on the on the ground. All kinds of different tanks, things. This has like a mag magnet that collects, you know, uh, debris. Uh, there's a train here. It's T R I I N. And robots, you know, R O B T and like everything spells. So this is grinder. Drill. <coughs> and here is a whole city that actually you can read everything in here casinos and hotel, uh, ship generator, and there are robots and all kinds of things. And there are all kinds of little stories happening. There's like the robot that's escaping the tyranny of the matrix. Um, and I did this in. <laughs> Really, you know, it was really retarded way. I, I did this in Illustrator and Photoshop instead of doing some three D program. So like, I had to create every single shadow and every single, you know, the blur and everything. I had to do everything in Photoshop. So it took like three months. So it would have been a lot faster if I learned the three D program and just like put a light and then create a shadow. Um, this was also after. 12 years of working on this project, um, I was able to publish a book with it uh, through Harry Abrams, the publisher. So that was a really rewarding thing when the book came out. Um, and I also created a, a font that you can download. If you go to universerevolve.com, you can download this as a computer font. Um, and I really loved working with experimenting like with fonts and alphabet that challenges our conventional uh, system of linear, left to right, top to bottom. And uh, here's another font design called WENS, uh, which is an acronym uh, for West, East, North, and sound, South. So again, you know, our, our reading system goes from left to right and top to bottom. And the whole WENS system is based on these four directions. And you see how this visual system works throughout this alphabet. So if you see, this, these are the base uh, quarter of the, each letter. So you have A, B, C, through Z. And then I take the, each letter and then just simply rotate it uh, 90 degrees. And then rotate it again once again until you Full, uh, form a full character uh, letter. So now you have you have uh, one letter that contains four different directions within itself. So now you can write words and, and paragraphs and sentences without having to worry about the direction, without having to lose the consistency of uh, directions, like the problem that we have with our current alphabet model. 
So here, for instance, uh, do you want to try to read this one? One, yes. And now I can experiment with this in, in a setup like this. So you can, you can read, let's say, one, like that. You can read it like this. You can read it like this. Because you can choose the, you know, the quarter of each letter. And it's always going to be consistent. It's always going to be without the mistake or inconsistency of flipping that we have with the current alphabet. So here's an example of, uh, this is a haiku by Baisho, a, a famous haiku writer in Japan. So uh, an old pond, a frog jumps in, sound of water. So you have now left to right, bottom to top, left to right again, top to bottom, There is a power. Again, it offers infinite ways of reading like a little uh, labyrinth. And a lot of people say it has, it has a sort of a swastika element in it because of the four directional things that has an angle. Is again the same with power. And I love the, the this infinity aspect that you can just go in <coughs> infinite directions without losing the consistency. There is uh, life and death. And uh, these are two words uh, God and ego. Our next project is uh, sokko. It's, uh, in Korean, this means mixing, and is a alphabet alphabet mash mashup between Roman alphabet and Korean Korean alphabet, which is called Hangul. And here is an example of Hangul. Uh, and Hangul is a again a revolutionary writing system and alphabet that was invented by. Uh, a Korean, famous Korean king called uh, Sejong. He's uh, printed on the 10,001 uh, Korean money. And like, uh, like our uh, Western alphabet, phonetic uh, alphabet, uh, Phoenician alphabet, this is also based on uh, the system of uh, phonetic language, which has vowels and consonants. And like Roman alphabet has, you know, the, the A to Z, and uh, this is a uh, hunger. So you can see um, these are, you know, some of the, some of them are uh, consonants, some of them are vowels. And the reason why it was revolutionary uh, at the time was because similar to what uh, Western civilization was going on when the phonetic alphabet by Phoenicians were invented, Korea at the time was using. Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese characters. So only the scholars and only the, the politician could really read these characters and have access to information. So these, the Korean king wanted to create a system that would be accessible to everybody so that information could be accessible to everyone. He was, has a very democratic uh, idea about how the country should be run and he decided to invent an alphabet from scratch. I'm not sure if he had the knowledge about the, the uh, Phoenician alphabet, but it's equally as revolutionary as the Phoenician alphabet. Um, so here we have the Roman alphabet, A to Z, and then we have the hunger, so those are the consonants and vowels. So what I did was simply taking the, the Roman alphabet, uh, the consonants of the Roman alphabet, and the vowels of the Korean alphabet, hunger, and just simply combining them. So I think for the Koreans who understand both languages can read this. Can you? Yeah, we'll say all right. So it's it's a uh, you know when I show this for the first time for Koreans, they always smile because they have never seen a new language like this. But and it's combining the the Western alphabet and it's, and it's still very clear for them to read. 
And uh, here's a funny one. It says, Popohaka uh, kisaka, which means, shall we kiss? But in, in, in two different, this is, kiss is a, is a, a, is a con, what we call Konglish. Like we adopt Western English uh, languages and make it into Korean. And lots, you know, the loss of Konglish words in Korea, like bus or taxi or computer, and kiss is one of those things. And popo is a, is a Korean version of kissing, and kiss is a Konglish. So that's a, playing with the words. Well, the next project is uh, called Nine Circle Numbers, and uh, it's an experiment with numbers. And, and I like to play with the systems, and you know, after playing with a lot of with the alphabet, I wanted to play with the, the system of numbers. Again, is numbers are one of those things that we just take it for granted. These simple shapes that were invented thousands of years ago by Arabs. Uh, it's just there, we just look at it and we just you know, use this number. We never really question where they're from, why they're here, why we're using this, and you know, we never really question these things. Like in the 14th century, we didn't really question that the, the, the earth was uh, flat. You know, that was what we were told at, back in the days. Or we didn't really question that the, uh, the, the sun was going around the earth instead of the other way around because that's how things were taught. And I, well, well, I think the Egyptians and other people had other ideas about solar system, but for the most part in the, the Western European uh, culture, you know, the whole idea of the geocentric uh, universe was universally accepted at the time until Galileo came and challenged that idea and he was considered, you know, it was considered heresy to even challenge that, that notion. So, um, I, you know, and I think that's what we, that's what human minds tend to do. We just tend to accept things that were taught by our parents and our, our teachers. Um, not that they're wrong, but I think it's dangerous just to accept things as they were given to us. So I wanted to experiment with numbers. Uh, and numbers are pure abstract symbols. They have no really meaning behind the shape. So if we one day decided to sh change the, each uh, uh, symbol into something like this, the system could work without any problem because there is no meaning behind it. So what if a uh, number had actual logic behind uh, each shape? What if the number followed the logic that anybody, you know, if you sent this number system to to the space and aliens could look at it for the first time, they would understand without having to decipher the system. So these nine circle numbers based on the, the system of grid of nine circles. And it's a very intuitive way of uh, interacting with number because uh, you can just count the element within this grid of nine circles. So you know this is one, two, three, four, five, six, so on and on. Um, so here we have number eight, because you can just count uh, the elements within this grid. There's nine. And when you go to number 10, uh, so this number is because based on the decimal system, not in a binary system or other system, we have to add the zero. And when that decimal gets added, uh, the other layer of grid of nine circle gets added to that. So each which zero has its, its assigned color. So, what number is this one? No? No, so, so that's, remember that uh, uh, whenever a zero gets added, another layer of grid of nine circle gets added. One hundred. Yes. Why do you have to do it to count? <laughs> 427. Correct answer. That's easy, really easy. Yes. 
And um, here is a calendar. 2000 was created in 2005. That's a calendar of the year 2005. And on the top, there is a, there is a month of the year. There are 12 circles. At the, at the bottom, you have the days of the week, and then you have the days of the month, um, and so on. So that's February, and that's June. And the, I designed in a way that the colors of the, the circle of the month changes accordingly. Uh, so that reflects the temperature of the season in the northern hemisphere. So as you get closer to July, in June, the summer season, the color gets hotter. And now you're in the summer, and then it gets cold again. And then you have uh, December. So um, these are all personal projects I do outside of my work time. Um, again, this is a school project. Uh, started as a school project, and I ended up developing it years after. When I was, uh, this was done when I was working at uh, Saatchi. Um, there were lots of free times. It was a big company, and I had my own office, and nobody really checked on what I was doing. <laughs> so, you know, I would have a few meetings, and you know, when I had free time, I would work on my personal projects. And uh, a lot of, this is, this is one of the, those projects that came out. And I love doing personal projects because uh, I can pick up, pick up things that I started at, uh, uh, when I was in school, like Universe Revolve, there are these numbers, system and really develop further because I think when I was at school I had the full time and energy to devote to things that I really really wanted to work on these were like things that I felt passionate about these were the years that I felt really creative and like I can do things that I really wanted to do and then once I got a job you know you have to take care of doing your job first and all those ideas that I had in the school years became like the second plan. So whenever I had the free time, I would pick up things I started and then develop even further because there were lots of great ideas I thought that needed and deserved more attention. So I carried that practice of always doing, always finding time to the personal project, no matter how busy things got at work. And uh, these are some of the projects that related to typography. And I do things that unrelated typography, but uh, this one uh, was uh, painting the billboards. And uh, it was part of the project called the New York Street Art Takeover, where hundreds of uh, people got together. And uh, one afternoon on Saturday, we, there's one team that came and painted all these billboards white. And there's a, another team of artists who came to paint this white billboard into something else. And I was one of these artists who painted the billboards. A lot of the other artists got uh, actually uh, uh, they got arrested because they were doing something illegal. Um, here's another fun typographical experiment. Uh, this was a professional job. I think I did for a uh, fast company. Um, each month they invited uh, designers to illustrate that month and they gave me May. And it was great that it was May instead of December. There's a much longer word. I was very happy about that. So um, here are some details of. Uh, there's a lot of Photoshop work going on here. Uh, these little babies, and I think a lot of this typographical experiment is ended up uh, influencing the way I think about, way I think about type in general, way I think about uh, design in general. So I really think type first many times. Um, and here is a, uh, can you see what that is? Yeah, so very simplified uh, Google logo. We made stickers. You can see it's a little bit scratched. Oh no, it's not here, it's not my laptop. But it's a, it's a sticker, you can put it, um, and people seem to like it because it feels like it's, it's a cool way of branding a company. And people would be, you know, they will be willing to put that on their laptop. Here's another experiment with uh, Google logo. These are platonic solids. Uh, each shape, suppose it was the shapes were invented by Plato back in the day, and each, each uh, 
shape is supposed to represent one of the elements of the universe. And that's the end of the presentation. And you can see a lot of all my projects at uh, my website, pleaseenjoy.com. And thank you very much for coming.